Hey everybody, happy Level 2. It's great that you could join us here this morning. A special welcome to you if you are joining us for the very first time. If that is you, please let us know in the chat. We are stoked that you could make it and we hope you enjoy your time with us here this morning. One of the things we love to do here at Elam International Church is to celebrate. So if you are celebrating perhaps a birthday, an anniversary, you're celebrating a job opportunity, or perhaps that online package arriving this week. Please let us know, pop it in the chat. We'd love to celebrate with you. Coming up on the 20th of September, we have 21 days of prayer. And if there was a time for the church to pray, now is the time. Please join us, please pray with us. Uh, More information on that will be coming shortly. Hey, now it's the time for the main event of this morning. We have um, Pastor Haley Barrett, who is the principal of Elam Leadership Co- College, coming to bless us this morning with an incredible word. Please lean in and please receive all that God has for you. You will be blessed. Well, good morning, church. So good to be with you all this morning, coming to you via the internet. I uh, hope you're doing well. Greetings from lockdown level four. I know you guys are in Delta level two, but whatever level we are this morning, I want to talk to you about some things that are going to bring you life. And because of that, I'm going to preach from the biblical concept of the tree of life. And I'm going to look at four proverbs, which describe things as a tree of life. And my hope is this, that this morning we will posture and position ourselves towards that, which is life giving. Come on, before I begin, let's pray. Lord, I pray for every person right now under the sound of my voice who is leaning into your word. I pray right now that in the name of Jesus, the presence of God will fill the room exactly where they're at, that they would hear your voice, your gentle whisper, that they'd hear your direction, that they'd hear your correction, that they'd hear your voice and be transformed into Christ's likeness. God, we're here because we love you and we want to hear from you in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Uh, Well, proximity is defined as nearness in space, time, or relationship. And in life, proximity matters. You know this because of your Wi-Fi connection. When it comes to your Wi-Fi connection, proximity matters. The closer you get to the modem, the stronger the connection will be. Proximity matters. Proximity matters when you go to a concert. How many people know that you pay more for tickets that are closer to the stage? Why? Because the closer you get to the person performing, the better the experience is. Proximity matters. Proximity matters when you're booking accommodation for your holiday. The closer you are to the attractions, the better the accommodation is. Proximity matters in our relationships one to another. Have you even noticed that if you're not walking in close proximity to someone, you tend to foster a culture which allows for misunderstanding or miscommunication in your relationships? Proximity matters. You better believe today that in your relationship with God, proximity matters. Nearness and closeness to God matters. The closer you are to Him, the more you're going to be transformed by His life. And that's what the picture of the tree of life is all about. It's all about proximity to God. I'm going to break this down a little bit for you. One of the things that you might notice about the creation account is that God gives us some topography. He gives us the lay of the land, if you will. This is what it says in Genesis 2 verse 8 to 9. It says, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I want to show you something. Here we have what I would call three tiers of sacred space. We have Eden, the garden, and the middle of the garden. The text also seems to indicate that the Garden of Eden is on top of a mountain because from it flows a river which waters the land. 
Interestingly, these three tiers of sacred space are reflected when God gives plans to build the tabernacle and the temple. The tabernacle and the temple which were to house the presence of God. Let me show you this. They had an outer court a holy place, and then a holy of holies, a most holy place. And it was in the most holy place that God put the Ark of the Covenant, which was where his presence came and dwelt. There was three tiers of sacred space, just like the Garden of Eden. And so in the Garden, you have the uh, you have Eden, which is like the outer court. You have uh, the Garden of Eden, which is like the holy place. And then you have the middle of of the garden, which is the Holy of Holies. This was the place where Adam and Eve met with God. Isn't it interesting that in creation, even before sin entered mankind, proximity mattered. There was proximity in the Garden of Eden. There was an outer court. There was a holy place. And then there was a most holy place. And the most sacred space was the middle of the garden where God would meet with Adam and Eve. You might be saying, why am I telling you this, Haley? This is way too hard for a Sunday morning. Well, I'm telling you this because it was here in the middle of the garden, in the most holy place, and like the holy of holies in the Garden of Eden, it was here that God planted two trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Now, he tells them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there is no such prohibition when it comes to the tree of life. In fact, they were expected to eat from the tree of life. This is what it says in Genesis 2, 15, 17. It says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now go with me. The reason that Adam and Eve needed to eat from the tree of life was because even before the fall, they were, even before they sinned, even before a sin entered humankind, even before the fall, they were still susceptible to death. In other words, God is immortal. God lives forever. God has eternity in his very makeup, but we weren't like God in our makeup, which was eternal in nature. Man's ability to live forever, to enter into eternity, even in the Garden of Eden, is dependent on their receiving God's own life. And so in the center of the garden, God places the tree of life, and continued eating from it would enable man's life to be renewed. And so what would Adam and Eve do? They would by faith eat the fruit of the tree. And as they did, they would be renewed by the gift of God's own life so that they could participate in eternal life. I really want you to get to get this today because I don't want you to go thinking that the fruit of the tree of life was like some philosopher's stone or was like some elixir of life. So that, you know, if you and I were to go find the long lost tree of life, you know, we'd be enabled to live forever. Listen, this is not an Indiana Jones movie. There was no innate magical power in the fruit that enabled Adam and Eve to live forever. The power wasn't in the fruit. This is what I want you to get. The power was in what the fruit represented. You see, Adam and Eve ate the fruit the same way you and I take communion, like you guys did this morning. In fact, eating the fruit of the tree of life was like the first communion ever taken. And just like you and I take the bread and the wine to represent our communion, our fellowship, here we go, our proximity with God and our transformation by his life. So Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of life to represent their proximity to God and their transformation by his life. This is why it's important that the tree of life was in the middle of the garden. It's a communication that the life wasn't found in the fruit. The life was found in what they had to go into to get it. And what they went into to get it was proximity to the very presence of God. 
You need to understand that the whole tree of life concept represents this thought. It is proximity to God that enables transformation in you. The more we come into his presence, the more we will be transformed by his life. That is what the tree of life is all about. Listen to me, this lockdown, I need to know the things that are going to transform me into the image of God. I need to know the things that are going to send me to proximity to God and transformation by his life. And that's why these four Proverbs are so important to us. Four times Proverbs describe some things as trees of life. This is what they mean. Things that are going to enable your proximity to him and your transformation by his life. Are you ready this morning? Let's hit these four things. The first thing that Proverbs describes as a tree of life is wisdom. It says that wisdom is a tree of life. Here's Proverbs 3 verse 13 and then forward to verse 18. It says, blessed are those who find wisdom and those who gain understanding. She is a tree of life. To those who take hold of her and those who hold fast will be blessed. You know, it's truly fascinating that the first thing that Proverbs describes as a tree of life is wisdom. It's fascinating because when you think about it, in the garden, what Adam and Eve really had was a choice between knowledge and wisdom. That choice between two trees was really a choice between knowledge and wisdom. They had a choice of whether to define their own good or accept God's definition of good for themselves. See, knowledge says man defines what prospers life and what destroys life. Wisdom says only God can define what prospers life and what destroys life. Knowledge says, I will define for myself what is good and evil. Wisdom says, I trust God to define what good and evil is. Knowledge says, I know best. Wisdom says, God knows best. And when you think about it, this was the choice represented in the Garden of Eden. It was the choice between wisdom or knowledge. And by choosing the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, men choose to try and shape paradise by themselves. They choose to try and define what good means for them. They choose to try and define what prospers life and what destroys life. And the problem is we can't. As hard as man tries to define paradise for ourselves, we repetitively fall short. And the evidence of that is all around us. Sickness, war, conflict, famine, none of these things existed in the Garden of Eden. They are the results of a man, of man's decision to define good for himself when we ultimately cannot. Because the truth we have to recognize is that only God has the ability to create a garden paradise such as Eden. But our living in it is dependent on our submission to the owner of the garden. It's the decision between wisdom and knowledge. In fact, Proverbs puts it like this. It says, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Friend, wisdom is a tree of life because wisdom submits to God. It places us in proximity to him, which allows us to be transformed by his life because it's proximity that enables transformation. Wisdom is a tree of life. And if you want a takeaway point this morning, it would be this. I will choose wisdom over knowledge. Firstly, wisdom is described as a tree of life. Secondly, righteous people are described as a tree of life. This is what the proverb says, Proverbs 11.30. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and the one who is wise saves lives. 
See, what the book of Proverbs is telling us is that surrounding yourself with fruitful believers is going to enable you to get closer to God and thereby be transformed by his life. Now, I want you to notice that very intentionally I said surround yourself with fruitful believers. Surround yourself with believers who are bearing fruit. Listen to me. When you're looking for someone to glean from, when you're looking for someone to grow with, when you're looking for someone who's going to encourage, correct, and hold your soul accountable, don't look for someone who just says the right words. Don't look for someone who has the right worship moves. Listen, you anyone can jump to a song with a good beat. That isn't necessarily representative of fruit. When you're looking for someone to surround yourself with and grow with, look at someone who is manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. Look for someone who is abounding in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Look for someone not who's manifesting words of wisdom because words are like air and something. Sometimes they can flow or fly away. Look for people who are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. Because Proverbs says that those people are unto you a tree of life. That getting around them enables your proximity to God and your transformation by His life. Here's your takeaway point today. It's that I will surround myself with people who bear the fruit of righteousness. And in your rooms, I bet you're saying a big amen. Listen, I don't bet you're saying. I'm hopeful that you're saying a big amen. All right, point number three today. Fulfilled longing is a tree of life. Fulfilled longing is a tree of life. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Here it is. But longing fulfilled is a tree of life. You know, have you ever noticed that in life it's so much easier to accept a quick no than to have a long drawn out season of disappointment? When you hope and then the door is closed, you hope and then the thing doesn't come through, you hope and then it doesn't play out the way you thought it was going to play out. The Bible says that this season of deferred hope, it erodes the health of your inner life. It makes your heart sick. But the Bible also says something about the opposite. It says that the opposite of that, a fulfilled longing, is a tree of life. How many people know that when a longing, a deep desire of your heart that you have carried is fulfilled, that thing enables your proximity to God and transformation by his life. And I know many in this room will have experienced what it's like to have a longing fulfilled. But what do we do with the longings that don't seem to be fulfilled? How do we deal with that? Well, very simply, we do so in the knowledge that in Christ, all desire will be fulfilled either here or in eternity. Because you need to understand today that the Garden of Eden, it is by definition a place of fulfilled longing. And because of this, this scripture doesn't point back to Eden. It points forward to new creation, where all longings and desires will be fulfilled. Revelation 22 verse 1 to 2, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing down from the throne of God and the lamb down in the middle of the great city of God. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding fruit in its every season. Isn't it interesting that in Eden we find a garden temple from which flowed a river, in the center of which stood a tree. And in new creation, we find a garden city, in the center which stood a tree, and from which flowed a river. So you need to understand today that this scripture is pointing us forward to new creation, the place where all desires will be fulfilled. Here's your takeaway point. I will trust Jesus to fulfill all my longings. Here's your fourth point today. A soothing tongue is a tree of life. A soothing tongue is a tree of life. Proverbs 15 4 says the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. See, words have either the power to hurt 
or to heal, to draw people close to the presence of God, to speak words that have transformative power over their life, or it has the power to crush and to speak death. And what I felt to say to you today is, are the words that you are speaking over your life, are they in agreement with heaven's agenda for your life? Or are they in agreement with hell's agenda for your life? Because you have a choice with what you do with the power of your tongue. Are your words over yourself, the thoughts that you think over yourself, the attitudes that you hold over yourself, are they in agreement with heaven's plan, heaven's agenda, heaven's will over your life? Or are they in agreement with hell's agenda over your life? Because the reality is this, a soothing tongue can be unto you like a tree of life. It will enable your proximity to God. It will enable your transformation by his life. And so the question is, what are you speaking over yourself today? Wisdom is a tree of life. Righteous people are a tree of life. Fulfilled longing is a tree of life. And a soothing tongue is a tree of life. What are you placing yourself in proximity to today? Friend, as we close, you know, I wanted to say it's interesting, isn't it, that the Bible starts with creation. It starts with a temple garden on top of a mountain from which flows a river. And at the center of it is a tree of life. And then after the fall of man, the biblical story finishes with new creation, which is a garden city on top of a mountain from which flows a river, which has a tree of life in the center of it. It's interesting to me today that that is how the biblical story starts and finishes, because in the middle, there is a very different mountain on which stood a very different sort of tree. See, in the middle of the biblical story, we stumble upon a place called Mount Calvary on which stood a tree which looked like a tree of death. It was the tree that our Savior Jesus hung on for your sin and for mine. But you need to understand today that that which looked like a tree of death atop a mountain has become for you and for me a tree of life. You need to understand today that that biblical picture in Genesis of the tree of life was always meant to point to the life of Jesus. Jesus is our tree of life and our proximity to him is the thing that enables transformation in us. Jesus put it like this. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He is the life that enables us to live forever. He is the one that we symbolically eat and drink of to be transformed into eternal life. And just like that fruit of the tree of life represented proximity to God and transformation by his life, so today you and I have drunk of the fruit of the vine and ate of the bread of life to represent our proximity to our Jesus and our transformation by his life. He is the life that allows us to live forever. And so to anyone who is listening this morning, to anyone who has tuned in to this message, whether you are far off or close, whether you've known Jesus before and walked away, or whether you've never heard the gospel message before, you need to understand that God has allowed us to come close. He has made a way in the person of Jesus. Jesus has removed every sin, obstacle, mistake, and imperfection. That could possibly keep you from the presence of God. And if you trust in him, partake in his life, come close to the person of God, you will be transformed into eternal life. And so if you don't know him, uh, if you have known him before and you want to recommit your life, I'm going to pray a prayer. And in your homes, I want you to pray it too. Just say, dear Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Today, I give my life to Jesus, holding nothing back. I turn from sin. I follow you. Thanks to you, I'm free. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 
Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you're praying it for the first time in a long time, or if you prayed it last week and you just felt like you wanted to pray it again, listen, there's a, a button that's coming up on the screen. It says that you raise your hand to commit your life to Jesus. I want you to go ahead and click that button. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to hand back to the team. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for giving me some mo moments this morning to spend time with you. I pray that you've been blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. What an amazing message. Thank you, Pastor Haley. Now, if you said yes to Jesus, congratulations. That is the best decision that you'll ever make. Secondly, please do let us know. We wanna get behind you. We wanna support you in your journey with Jesus. There'll be some instructions coming up in the chat. Please follow those links and let us know if that was you. What an incredible time we've had together this morning. To close our service, here's a prayer of blessing from Pastor Boyd. Wow, what a phenomenal word. Thank you, Pastor Haley Barrett, for that. Well, church, I'd love to pray a prayer of blessing over you uh, this morning. But before I do that, can I tell you, I'm standing in an empty auditorium. But here's the reality. Here's the truth. Church is not about a building. It's about God and people. You are the church. We are the church. So let's be the church wherever we are this week, whether at home or at school, in your workplace, wherever you are. Can I encourage you to be the church? Let's be the church. Father, thank you for every person watching the service right now. God, I pray for your blessing over them. We pray for your protection. We pray for your power, your presence. Lord, we declare the promises of God over every household, over every family over every individual. The Lord bless you and keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.